Welcome to the CIHR Team in Children's Pain and CAFC webinar series on children's pain. The series on children's pain will be a three-part series looking at a variety of issues in children's pain, including current knowledge and attitudes towards pain, organizational culture as it relates to pain, management and assessment of pain in children, and much more. The CIHR Team in Children's Pain and this webinar series are funded by a grant from the Canadian Institute of Health Research. The first episode, From Pokes to Post-Op, an overview of pain prevention and management in hospitalized children will bring an overview of issues in children's pain. This session is presented by Drs. Bonnie Stevens and Fiona Campbell. Episode 2, scheduled for March 23, 2010, is titled Reducing Pain in Infants and Young Children During Pokes and Other Procedures and will be presented by Drs. Denise Harrison, Margot Latimer, and Christine Chambers. Episode 3 is scheduled for September 21, 2010, and this topic is still to be determined. I'm Doug Maynard, Associate Director at CAFC, and welcome to Episode 1 of this webinar series on children's pain. From Pokes to Post-Op, an overview of pain prevention and management in hospitalized children will be presented by Dr. Bonnie Stevens and Fiona Campbell. Dr. Bonnie Stevens is the Signe Hilder Eaton Chair in Pediatric Nursing Research, Associate Chief Nursing Research and Senior Scientist at Hospital for Sick Children. She is the, a professor in the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing and Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. She is also the director of the U University of Toronto Centre for the Study of Pain and co-director of the Centre for Pain at Sick Kids. Her research interests include the assessment and management of pain in infants and the effectiveness of knowledge translation strategies. She is the principal investigator of the CIHR team in children's pain. Dr. Fiona Campbell is an anesthesiologist in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Medicine and project investigator in the Research Institute at the Hospital for Sick Children. She is an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. She is also co-director of the Center for Pain at SickKids. Her clinical focus is in the management of complex chronic pain in children. She is involved in developing strategic initiatives to improve pediatric pain management. Her research interests include knowledge translation on pain in children and acute chronic and sickle cell pain. She is a co-investigator of the CIHR team in children's pain. Dr. Campbell, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Doug, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, on behalf of Bonnie and me, I would like to welcome all of you, whoever you are, <laughs> to the first of the webinar series on pain in children. This is a collaboration between CAFC and the CIHR team in children's pain, for which the principal investigator is Dr. Bonnie Stevens. It is an honor to be presenting with her today. This is the, um, as Doug uh, mentioned, this is the first of a series of uh, three webinars. I'll come on to ours in just a moment, but to reiterate, the second webinar will, is entitled Be Sweet to Babies, Reducing uh, Pain in Infants and Young Children During Pokes and Other Procedures, and that will be presented by Denise Harrison and Margot Latimer. Uh, which will be presented on March the 23rd at noon. And then the uh, third in the series is entitled Pain Matters in Children and Adolescents. The presenters are to be determined, and that will be on Tuesday, September the 21st at noon. So here we go with the first uh, webinar, From Pokes to Post-Op, an Overview of Pain Prevention and Management in Hospitalized Children. Uh, before proceeding, just a quick disclaimer statement that Bonnie, uh, neither Bonnie nor I have any financial relationships to disclose or conflicts of interest, uh, and to say that the CIHR team in children's pain and the translating research on pain in children that we refer to as TROPIC, uh, those grants are funded by CIHR. And while we have no conflicts of interest, I would, I would like to disclose that I have not done a webinar before, so a brief appeal for you to bear with us, and that it is somewhat odd to be in the dark as to whether I am actually speaking to three or 300 of you. So the objectives of this seminar are that uh, hopefully uh, you will be able to describe the relevance and implications of good pediatric pain practices, you will be able to apply evidence to assess and manage pediatric pain more effectively. And importantly, you will be able to describe organizational and unit-based strategies to improve pain practices. And we hope to achieve that by following uh, this agenda, which is uh, going from pain within the child context to speaking to um, pain assessment, 
then pain management, and organizational and unit strategies, followed by a brief summary. Uh, I will be presenting section on uh, child context and on pain management, and uh, Bonnie will be presenting on pain assessment and on the organizational and unit strategies. We hope to keep the four sections to about an hour in total so that we have plenty of time for, que for questions. We will probably take questions at the end, but if there are emerging themes, we may pause and take some as we go. Pain within the child context. I'll uh, begin with some definitions and then to move on to some um, a patient story uh, and then on to risks and um, uh, inherent to uh, managing pain and uh, ha how we can uh, improve pain practices in children. Pain is defined as... Oh, Sorry, pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. And the important thing to um, uh, point out here is that pain is not simply a biological pain pathway, but that uh, it also is comprised of the emotional response uh, to uh, that sensory pathway. And there are a couple of other things to add to this definition, which is that the inability to communicate in no way negates the possibility that an individual is experiencing pain uh, or is in need of appropriate uh, pain relieving treatment. That pain is always subjective. And uh, in a sense, um, we're a bit disadvantaged when we're uh, assessing pain in that there isn't a blood test that gives us a particular diagnosis. So we are based with a subjective experience, and Bonnie will uh, elaborate on this on the section on uh, pain assessment. And uh, likewise, um, pain is what the experiencing person says it is. So I would like to appeal uh, to the audience to believe the patient, as sometimes those, particularly with chronic pain conditions, might report a pain score of 9 out of 10 and appear to be calmly watching television. This might be because they have learned effective distraction strategies uh, in order to manage their pain. And you can't always be writhing around and behaving in uh, an exaggerated manner when your pain is 9 out of 10, when at times you're spending quite a lot of time in, in severe pain. In order to uh, make this real, particularly for some of those who may not have pain at the forefront of your uh, uh, clinical practice, I would like to read an excerpt from one of my chronic pain patients' mums, and I do have permission from both Stephanie, the patient, and Denise, her mother, to share Stephanie's story. So I'm going to read to you from this narrative. Hi, I am Denise Clayton, and around here, I am otherwise known as Stephanie's mom. Stephanie has been a patient at Sick Kids since she was one hour old. She was born with an omphalocele, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's when the intestines uh, are, when the baby is delivered, the intestines are outside of the body. And she also had several heart conditions, which she has since overcome. Stephanie has had 14 major surgeries and over 85 procedures. She now has gastroparesis and pseudo bowel obstruction syndrome and reverse peristalsis. And these complex issues have left her with acute and chronic pain. Stephanie's pain is often debilitating. We will find her curled up in the fetal position alone, sobbing in her bed. Many days, Stephanie's pain makes it impossible for her to do even the simplest of tasks like walking to school or even putting on her shoes. Stephanie's personal pain management at times had consisted of aggressive, explosive, and unmanageable behavior. She yells, screams, kicks, hits, and spits over the most irrelevant things. Taking her temperature sometimes will send her over the edge. So it really is not the temperature that is the problem. It is the pain. It is her way of communicating her pain. 
Stephanie, for the most part, is a regular six-year-old girl. She always looks great and carries a lovely disposition with her. The pain is really what takes its toll. She takes six different pain medicines and is followed closely by the chronic pain team, but it is not enough. Children like Stephanie need the many teams to understand her pain. Sick Kids Hospital has been our home. It is our hope and our dream to move forward and allow Stephanie the opportunity to go to school, to resume downhill skiing, to continue another triathlon, to play soccer game this summer, and to take her ever-loved karate class. Stephanie has been living outside of Sick Kids since May. This is the longest she has ever been out of the hospital. She attempts to attend public school. She takes guitar, drumming, and art class as well as ballet and swimming lessons. Stephanie assures me that she will play hockey this summer and is currently learning Swahili <laughs> so she can be a scientist in Africa. Despite her pain, she is still very ambitious. And the reason that uh, I like to use Stephanie as an example is that she is representative of acute pain, she experiences recurrent pain, she has procedural pain, and she has chronic pain. So she really allows one to look at the whole trajectory of pain. Uh, and I hope for those of you who don't have patients that have a, a real pain experience in your own head that maybe you can reflect on Stephanie as we go through the presentation today. Pain is multidimensional. It may be complicated, and it can be described in different ways. It can be described in terms of its mechanisms, and uh, those are nociceptive and neuropathic, and they really refer to the biological mechanisms of pain. I'll further describe those in just a moment. Or it can be described in terms of its temporal characteristics. So uh, acute pain, chronic, which we are increasingly referring to as persistent pain, so chronic and persistent really mean the same thing, or recurrent pain, which might be intermittent bouts of acute pain. Nociceptive pain is typically sharp, well-localized, relatively easy to describe, and relatively, relatively easy to treat with conventional analgesics. It is activated through um, nociceptors, which are, spe are specialized pain receptors lo uh, um, local to the skin, and so they may be activated by a burn or a cut or surgery, some such thing. Neuropathic pain, on the other hand, uh, is uh, less uh, easy to describe, uh, more difficult to treat, uh, and we have a range of adjuvant medications that are helpful for this. But when, people, when we say someone has neuropathic pain, what they will be describing are either spontaneous pains, such as burning, shooting, throbbing, tingling, those sorts of things, or they may have something which we refer to as evoked pains. So evoked pains means in response to either a non-painful stimulus, they get a painful response, that's known as allodynia, or in response to a painful stimulus, they would have an exaggerated painful response, that is known, to as, known as hyperalgesia. Sometimes, uh, Neuropathic pain will have a specialized subset of it called complex regional pain syndrome or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And that is when the sympathetic nervous system uh, grows over some of the um, nerves uh, just outside of the central nervous system. And that will lead to sweating changes, color changes, temperature changes, and altered um, nail growth. When we refer to the temporal characteristics of pain, acute pain really is pain associated with a brief episode of tissue injury uh, or inflammation, uh, with the intensity of pain tending to decrease progressively over days to weeks. So this would be, for example, burns, you cut yourself, you have some surgery, or even the uh, normal bumps and bruises that are part of everyday life. Chronic pain, by its nature, is more challenging. Um, persistent or, or nearly constant pain over a period of three months or longer, which is rather arbitrary um, or otherwise described as pain that persists beyond the expected time of healing, such as neuropathic pain or cancer pain. But I'd like to make a point here that sometime in neonates who are having repeat procedures, they may develop a persistent or 
uh, chronic pain, but actually they haven't even been alive for three months. So I, so I think this notion of a, a time definition for chronic pain is somewhat limiting. So what are the benefits of good pain management? For sure, it's associated with child and family, uh, enhanced child and family satisfaction, which in turn will lead to increased compliance and cooperation by the patient. But we also know that it leads to faster recoveries and fewer complications. And uh, in fact, we are not meeting our accreditation standards if we don't manage pain um, properly. So, Doug, I'll leave you to do the poll question. We're just having a poll question pop up. So, uh, we're just asking about the risks of poor pain management. Uh, the risks that poor pain ma of poor, ma poor pain management can have: uh, short-term consequences, long-term consequences, both A and B, uh, and none. So, just uh, click on the screen and, and select your choice. Give people a few more seconds. We've uh, just about got everybody uh, everybody's choice in. So. By the way, how many people are on the line right now? Okay, that's pretty much everybody. So we'll just close this one off. And just about everybody picked uh, both A and B at 99 percent. One percent of people picked long-term consequences. Over to you, uh, Dr. Campbell. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you, Doug. Okay, so it looks uh, pretty great that um, uh, most of you appear to recognize that um, uh, there can be both short and long-term consequences to pain, and uh, I am going to elaborate on some of those just now. So in addition to the suffering, um, both physical and psychological, to the child and their family, we also know, and I, forgive me, most of this uh, information comes from the adult population, that poorly controlled post-operative pain is associated with slower recoveries, uh, prolonged uh, stays in hospital, uh, increased risk of complications, unplanned readmissions to hospital, and an increased incidence of chronic pain. It also in animals is associated with depressed immune function and um, uh, increased tumor growth. And for all of these reasons, it is also expensive. So that was uh, adult information, but there's some evidence to suggest, and it's fairly compelling, that children are at particular risk. We know that research suggests that pain early in life leads to um, not only anxiety and fear associated with uh, procedures, but also heightened biological pain sensitivity to subsequent painful stimuli. We know that neonates circumcised without analgesia have uh, increased pain responses to subsequent immunization, and that's work from Anna Taddeo at uh, the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, and um, it may be explained by the um, uh, development of the uh, newborn's nociceptive pathways in that uh, at birth, the ascending painful pathways are fully developed, whereas the descending inhibitory modulating pathways are not so well established. So in contrast to what we previously believed that neonates did not necessarily experience pain, in fact, they may uh, experience more pain for a given stimulus than older children and adults. So there are some ethical risks of undertreating pain, and uh, the one that's quoted quite widely by Gary Waco from 1994, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, is that the assessment and treatment of pain in children are important parts of pediatric practice, and failure to provide adequate control of pain amounts to substandard and unethical me medical practice. So it is difficult to see how we can fulfill our obligation of providing the ethical care of children without attending to their pain and suffering. 
there are various standards, uh, international, national, and local, that we fall foul of if we don't um, uh, manage pain properly. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to leave those. You'll be able to allude to these um, uh, subsequently as this is going to be podcasted and move on to some uh, facts about uh, the undertreatment of pain in children. We know that children receive less analgesia than adults, and younger children receive less analgesia than older, and that all children receive less medication than that which is prescribed regardless of their reported pain level. We know that many children endure unacceptable levels of pain during hospitalization, and that upon discharge from hospital, uh, children report that pain is the worst aspect of hospitalization and the area most needing improvement. And just an example of a study from our own hospital where we did a snapshot audit of every inpatient. Now, this is in 2004, and we have some evidence to suggest we can be cautiously optimistic because some things are improving. improving. We looked in this audit at the uh, pain assessment documentation, prevalence of pain, uh, and a little bit about analgesia. And we found that pain is common, 77% of all patients. Only 20% of pain assessment was documented. And um, for those in pain, only 50% received analgesia. But look at that, 87% who received any analgesia at all found it helpful. This is not rocket science. We know how to assess pain and treat pain. We have a gap of getting this into practice. So there was the um, graph uh, across the board at the hospital by um, specialty area. So if you think that your area doesn't have pain, I can show you from that slide that really it's pretty closely clustered around that 77%. And we also know that of those patients who have had pain, 64% had moderate to severe pain in the previous 24 hours. Very briefly, we've made a lot of effort at Sick Kids to address this, and these are strategies that Dr. Stevens is going to refer to later. And you can see on the left-hand side of this chart, the um, assessment in 2006 was beginning to improve at about 30 to 40 percent, and uh, it is now um, steadily up at about 80 percent. And I can tell you that it's uh, continuing to improve, and it is being sustained. So we don't know why pain is relatively neglected. It's not the main reason for admission to hospital, perhaps because it's a byproduct of the main reason it gets a little neglected. There's no diagnostic test for pain. There are myths and misconceptions about treatment, and there's relatively little pain education. We can see that uh, medical students have about 20% of the hours of um, uh, dedicated pain education than vets do. Now, I don't really want to suggest that we take our children to the vet for pain control, but that is something that, uh, that does need to be addressed. And uh, I know uh, that it is being addressed and that things uh, are continuing to improve. So I'm now going to hand over to my uh, colleague, Dr. Stevens, uh, for the um, session, the, the, the section on pain assessment. I thank you for your attention, and I think we'll be dealing with questions uh, towards the end. Thank you, Fiona. And I also would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to our uh, first webinar. We've been really looking forward to this, and uh, we really thank you for joining in today. So I'm going to talk to you about pain assessment because we always say that pain assessment is the cornerstone of good management. And when we think about pain assessment, I just want to start with two principles. We talk about assessment, which really describes and estimates all aspects of the pain experience. So this is really referring to a more holistic approach to determining pain and how it affects the child and family. Whereas measurement, which we really focus on mostly, describes the quantification of one aspect of pain. So, for example, how much does it hurt on a scale of 0 to 10? And this is what we refer to as pain intensity. So why don't we have adequate pain assessment? 
We know that um, there's a failure to uh, recognize the multidimensional nature of pain. Fiona has talked about how pain is complex. Uh, there's also inappropriate timing of assessment. Often we aren't assessing uh, when the pain is at its peak or when the intervention is at its peak. Uh, sometimes we have difficulties interpreting the assessment data. What do the numbers on a scale of 0 to 10 mean? Uh, there's underutilization of pain measurement tools. You're going to learn from today that there's many, many tools out there, but often we don't use them. And also, uh, there's inadequate documentation. So even though people may assess pain, they don't document it, and therefore that information is not transmitted to the next person who's caring for the child. When we think about uh, pain, we think about uh, the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional factors that influence the child's pain. So if we think about a child, we first need to think about their age, their level of understanding, their gender, their temperament, whether or not they've had previous pain experiences and how these have gone, what's normal in the family, and what's the cultural perspective on pain. And then when you think about from a cognitive perspective, what is it that you and your child understand and believe about the cause of pain? From a behavioral perspective, what do you and your child do to lessen the pain? And from an emotional perspective, how does your child feel about being in pain? So you can see it's, the assessment is what is important here. It's much broader than just asking how much hurt there actually is. If we think about some parallels between disease and pain diagnosis and management, in disease we talk about diagnosis and in pain we talk about pain assessment from all these perspectives. In disease we think about how severe it is and in pain we think about how severe or how intense the pain is, so the pain intensity score. And in disease, we think of a treatment plan, and similarly in pain, we consider a pain management plan. So if we think about doing a pain assessment in the real world, we would want to have a good history from the patient and uh, family. So when we talk about pain, we don't just want to know how much it hurts, but we want to know the location, the quality, the duration, the intensity, and whether any previous medication has been used. We're also interested in the particular type of pain, whether it's a nociceptive pain or a neuropathic pain, and the severity of the pain. And this is where we hope to use validated pain assessment tools. We also want to know how much pain affects function and that is mood, uh, symptoms of depression or anxiety, whether pain is interfering with sleep, and whether there's functional disability. For children in particular, are they missing school? Are there, are they, is it interfering with hobbies that they like to do or socialization? And also social circumstances. Are they missing out on fun activities uh, with their uh, friends? Uh, the history is followed by a physical examination to really determine uh, more of these aspects about pain, and there may be follow-up additional uh, investigations to help diagnose the pain. So I think we're now going to go to the next poll, and Doug, can you take over from here, please? Sure. Uh, the next poll is what approximate percentage of hospitalized children uh, have their pain assessed with a pain assessment tool in a 24-hour period, and this off, uh, the options are on your screen now, so just please make a selection. Just about have everybody making a selection, so we'll uh, just a couple more seconds and all right, so we'll just close this poll off. 
And there's uh, the response is 55% said 20% of children within the, in a 24 hour period, 29% said 40% of children, 12% said 80% of children, 2% said 100% of children, and 2% also said 0% of children. Thank you, Doug. That's great. So uh, you heard Fiona say earlier that uh, when we started tracking this uh, at SickKids, we were down around the 20% range. And over the years, we've increased uh, gradually. Uh, but if you look across a number of studies, you see about 40% or so of kids have uh, pain assessed. What I'm showing you here is uh, pain assessment that we did in our most recent study on the CIHR team in children uh, across uh, Canada. And you'll see that uh, of all children that we looked at, 69% had some sort of pain assessment uh, done. But you'll also see that only 29% had a validated pain assessment tool. About the same 26% had some narrative charted uh, in the chart, and about 13% had both. So you can see that we have a long way to go, and in this case, where pain assessment tools were used, only 20% or so of those were validated. This is uh, more data that came out of the uh, CIHR team in children's pain. And you'll see here these are some of the validated tools. And I'm going to talk about some of these, uh, the numeric rating scale, the FLAC or the face, legs, activity, cry, consolability scale. Um, and you can see as we go down the list, there are several uh, validated t uh, scales that are used, but the most common one was the uh, numeric rating scale. So when we think about assessing pain in children, there are three ways that we can do that. Ideally, because pain is subjective, if we can ask the child to report on their own pain, that's the ideal way. But if that's not uh, available to us, we can observe. We train observers on cues to look at in terms of the child's behavior. And we also can assess pain uh, using a physiologic indicators or how the body, child's body is reacting to pain. So when we ask the child, we can start uh, listening to what the child says from very early on. The 18-month to 3-year-old will understand uh, surrogate words for pain, such as owie or hurt. At 4 to 5 years old, they're able to quantify the degree of pain, often by saying they have a little bit of pain or a lot of pain. The school age child certainly understands the word pain, and we can use that word when we're asking them. And children uh, that are greater than six years old often can give detailed descriptions of pain intensity, quality, and location. And if you think back to uh, the patient that Fiona talked about, Stephanie, who is six years old, we can certainly identify with her being able to describe her pain in great detail. Um, some of the validated self-report measures are the FACES scales. I'm going to show you these in a moment. Something we call the four-point verbal scale, uh, which can be used uh, with children greater than four years of age. The numeric rating scale, which is usually used over seven years of age. And the visual analog scale, also used over seven years of age. So these are some examples of the uh, FACES pain scales. One of the most common that you'll see at the top of the slide is called the, uh, the Bieri FACES scale, which was revised by Hicks in 2001. That came out of Australia. Uh, the next one down, the Wong-Baker scale uh, by Donna Wong uh, out of the United States. Uh, and you'll see the other uh, pain scales. You'll all see that they uh, range from a fairly neutral face to a fairly, fairly distressed face. And some of the critique has been around whether we should be using a happy face, which you'll see in some of the scales, and whether we should be using tears, because as you all know, some uh, children don't necessarily cry when they have, uh, when they have pain. In terms of a four-point verbal scale, this is where you'd ask the child to classify the pain into one of uh, four categories. So simply, you could ask, how much does it hurt? 
not at all or none, a little bit, a medium, or a lot. And this is the uh, type of uh, self-report you could expect to ask in, in children that were four or five or a bit older than that. Um, in terms of the numeric rating scale, and again, this is what is most commonly used, both with uh, children above age seven as well as with adults, and that's where we're asking uh, on a scale of zero to ten, how bad does it hurt or how much does it hurt? You need to make sure that the child can count up to ten and understand classification and seriation, and also that they understand language. So most often you'll will be saying if zero is no pain and ten is the worst pain imaginable or the worst pain you've ever thought about, how much pain are you having right now? Um, the self-report VAS or the visual analog scale is just a little bit different than that and usually this is done in a paper and pencil format or now even in electronic format where you would ask the child to mark somewhere along the uh, line where their pain is. It's important that the anchors, the no pain and the very severe pain be placed at the end of this scale because if they're pa placed underneath and take up room, we find that people don't put the mark where the, uh, the indicators are. And finally, physiologic indicators. We all know about these. Um, we, where we get the fight or flight response and we see increased heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, heart rate variability, intracranial pressure, all of these kinds of things. Uh, the problem with these is that they lack specificity and they're a response to stress. And so therefore you're liable to see these same kind of indicators uh, with anxiety as you are uh, in pain. And therefore these are have somewhat um, narrow uh, specificity and we tend to use these most in those incapable of self-report. There's also no standard pain assessment measure that rely exclusively on these parameters and the adaptation occurs quickly so it may not be applicable in persistent or chronic pain states. When we move on to uh, behavioral observation scales, um, this is where you observe pain for a specified period. So when you're looking at tools, we're really looking for a tool that says observe the child for 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Some of the pain behaviors that we're looking for are facial expression, body movements, cry, or other atypical functional behaviors. We always need to consider the context. How sick is this child? So how much would they be able to behaviorally respond? Also their developmental age or stage. The most valid uh, observation is in infants who lack the capacity to self-report. And facial expressions are the most uh, specific indicator of pain that we use in this population. So this is a, a cartoon from McCaffrey and Beebe, uh, and this really looks at the specific facial actions that you'll see that make up the uh, pain grimace. So you'll see the brows uh, lowered and drawn together, the forehead is bulging, the eyes are uh, tightly squeezed closed, the cheeks are raised, the nose is broadened and, and uh, splayed, and you'll see in the mouth it is stretched both vertically and horizontally, and if you look inside, you can even see that the tongue is taut and uh, tightly stretched. This is the uh, measure that my colleagues and I developed back in the mid-1990s. This is called the Premature Infant Pain Profile, or the PIP, and it's called a composite measure because it includes it, both different types of indicators, both the physiologic indicators, heart rate and oxygen saturation, along with three behavioral indicators, three facial expressions, and as well we take context, which we've said is important, the gestational age of the baby, as well as the behavioral state. And we've just revised the PIP, and we've revised it based on comments and 13 years of use. 
So we still have the same indicators as you can see, and we're just uh, defining them more clearly and adding them up in a different way. So hopefully this is going to make this easier and more uh, useful for people to use, and you'll be uh, hearing and seeing more about this in the near future. As we move to a little bit older child, um, there's the uh, flax scale, and this is the flax scale revised um, so that it can be used with uh, children that have uh, cognitive impairment. And again, we see a variety of indicators, both these are uh, behavioral indicators and another one that we haven't talked about called consolability. And each of these indicators is rated as a 0, 1, or 2, and they're all defined, and this adds up to a score out of 10. Now, when we think about um, children with dis disabilities, uh, one of the great sources of information uh, is from the parents who really know these children well. But you can see we're asking parents to observe or comment on many of the same kinds of things um, as are in other validated pain scales. So we're talking about uh, behavioral kinds of indicators such as vocal, body and limbs. We're talking about physiologic indicators. And as well, we're talking about functional. Uh, indicators. And one of the uh, scales, validated scales, that's been developed by Bro and all is the Non-Communicating Children's Pain uh, Checklist that's been validated for this population. We also have multidimensional assessment of chronic pain. And again, we talked about pain uh, that is lasting beyond the uh, reasonable point of healing. Although in children, we are reluctant, as uh, Fiona said, to say over three months or six months. Uh, but we really ask about pain over the preceding 24 hours. We look at uh, the coping and catastrophizing uh, coping strategies questionnaire, how uh, chronic pain might affect quality of life, uh, physical and emotional functioning, and ratings of improvement upon follow-up. So I'll just want to uh, try and pull this all together by talking about uh, some of the pain assessment policies here at SickKids. We see uh, pain as the fifth vital sign, and therefore we're trying to get people to assess pain on a regular basis along with the vital signs. Uh, pain is uh, assessed and documented by the nurse both on admission of the child once per shift, uh, before and after uh, an invasive procedure, and ideally within one hour of a pain intervention. The goal is to obtain uh, pain relief, and uh, we use the numerical score or behavioral goal. Uh, we introduce pain management interventions if the pain relief goal is not achieved, or we have some cutoff scores. If pain intensity scores are greater than 4 out of 10, if the child describes their pain as medium pain, if using the PIP the score is over 6, or if using the non-communicating tool if the score is over 10. And certainly we would want to reassess uh, within one hour uh, if those scores were in uh, place. Uh, we've described several tools, but these are the uh, repertoire of school of tools uh, that we use here at SickKids. So you can see that they range from the PIP for the babies um, right up to the numeric rating scale for the older children and the non-communicating children's pain uh, checklist. So I think we're just about finished this section on pain assessment. And Doug, maybe I'll get you to go to this next polling question uh, while Fiona and I switch places. For the next uh, polling question is, what is the average number of painful procedures experienced by a hospitalized children in a 24-hour period? And the choices are 1, 5, 15, and 20. So if you can make your selections on the screen now. All right, we'll close off this question. And there's the responses. 62% said that uh, the average child experiences five painful procedures in a 24-hour 24 24-hour period. 33% uh, uh, of the audience uh, thinks 15 uh, chil uh, children experience 15 painful 
painful procedures in a 24-hour period. 2% thought 20 painful procedures and 3% thought one. So back over to you. I think it's Dr. Campbell up now. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Doug. Well, uh, that's great. It looks like the majority of you have uh, recognized that um, there are multiple procedures, five on average. And um, so uh, we're now going to move on to the sorts of things that you can actually do about that. So before we begin, I would encourage you to get up stretch your legs and walk around your chair. Even though we've done our longest segments, it has been uh, 40 minutes or so, and I'll just give you 15 seconds to do that. All right, a short 15 seconds. Here we go. Before I actually begin this section, I would like to share a couple of very good questions that were posed prior to this webinar uh, by one of the attendees. And I liked these because they raised challenges of managing both surgical uh, and medical pain. So the first question was, uh, are there any standardized approaches to managing intra- and post-operative pain? And the examples that they were asked, that the uh, uh, person who submitted the questions was asking about was tonsillectomy and hernia. And the second question was, are there guidelines for pain management in sickle cell patients? And the specific example was uh, a 12-month-old opioid-naive child uh, and the relative merits of using infusions versus boluses. So I'm not going to answer these just now, but I will um, uh, because I hope that some of this will be covered as we go, and I will um, uh, come back to them at the end of this section. And this section, incidentally, is briefer than the, init than the um, uh, initial section uh, that I presented on. So, Doug, can I hand this uh, poll over to you and then uh, let me know when it's back to me? Sure. Uh, the next uh, poll question is, what are the preferred pain management strategies that we should use in children? And the choices are pharmacological, physical, psychologicals, or all of the above. Give everyone a chance to make their selections on the screen. Close up this poll and share the answers. So the vast majority uh, think that uh, all of the strategies uh, should be used. That's great. And we'll just go on to the next poll question, which is, which is a better pain medication for moderate to severe pain? Codeine, morphine, neither or both? All right, we'll close this one off and we'll see what the audience said. So 68% of people uh, think that morphine is the uh, better pain medication for moderate to severe pain, 5% codeine, 12% said neither of the two, and 15% said both. Well, um, I think you've all heard the results of those polls, which are that the majority of you in response to the first question felt that uh, pharmacological, physical, and psychological strategies are all helpful in managing pain. And uh, that's great because that is the message that uh, I will be um, reinforcing today. And uh, then the second question was, which is a better pain medication for moderate to severe pain? And 68% of you said morphine, but there was a bit more of a spread in that question. And I am going to come on to that in a few slides. So uh, historically, therapeutic interventions were uh, uh, lumped into pharmacological and non-pharmacological strategies. And one of the things that uh, I've been trying to do over the last few years is to really speak about the three Ps approach, so pharmacological, physical, and psychological strategies, because I think it does a disservice to the physical and psychological strategies to clump them uh, into a definition um, that really defines them in terms of something that they are not. So they're not drugs, so therefore they're non-pharmacological. I, I think we have to be more actively promoting the physical and psychological strategies that you can see there. 
And we've, okay, so a very brief physiology slide. Um, this is my, I, I'm not going to go into uh, this in detail, but you can see you have a nociceptor in the periphery, maybe in the skin. The information from that nerve is carried along the primary afferent neuron into the spinal cord, the cell body of that neuron it's just outside the spinal cord in actual fact. And then there's the ascending painful pathways that go up. You have the brain modulating things, descending modulating pathways, and then, of course, the spinal cord itself. Technically, it's a bit wrong because these pathways cross here, and I haven't managed to figure out how to do that. But I show this wiggly slide diagram because, um, for a start, someone told me once that if you show these, that people think you're more intelligent than you really are. Um, but uh, it's very hard uh, injecting humor here without <laughs> seeing the response. Um, but also, just on a very practical practical level here. Um, you can see that there are all kinds of targets for um, uh, pain interventions. And really, I should take pharmacological off the title bit of the title slide because uh, there are lots of things that are shown in this slide. So out in the periphery, you can use uh, uh, ice for um, peripheral inflammation over joints or sprains and so on. You can use heat in the muscles when they're tense. You can use local anesthetics um, for uh, pre preemptively for um, painful procedures, anti-inflammatories. Opioids are effective in a number of different areas. And then you have this complex organ here, the brain, where acetaminophen and opioids and psychological strategies may be modulating pain. So uh, moving on to the World Health Organization recommendations on pain relief, you can see from the previous slide that there are a multitude of uh, interventions that are helpful. And in fact, the notion of balanced analgesia, whereby more than one class of analgesic or adjuvant, uh, each working in different ways, provides better pain relief with fewer side effects. For sure, you can give enough morphine to someone and it'll get rid of all of the pain, but the side effect profile could be catastrophic. So um, we, we we like to smooth things out by using a, a balanced approach. And uh, just to add that medication, medication should be taken in a scheduled way uh, for ongoing pain. They should be taken by mouth uh, unless the oral route isn't available or you need a rapid um, escalation of uh, analgesia and by the ladder. And what I mean by the ladder is this. All right, so this is the analgesia ladder, where you begin with mild pain and you use acetaminophen and anti-inflammatory drugs for, for mild pain. And as pain escalates, this is in an acute pain model just at the minute, uh, you would keep these non-opioids and add in it historically a weak opioid, but I'm going to suggest that we really jump straight to the strong opioids for reasons that will become apparent in a, in a minute. And as pain abates, you come down the ladder, dropping off the opioid first and then um, uh, withdrawing the acetaminophen and anti-inflammatories uh, as pain comes under good control. And so this step here in the, minute, uh, in the middle for moderate pain where we um, uh, used to speak to using codeine is actually a step that I think could be removed and maybe this should become the analgesia step rather than a ladder. Um, I'm going to speak about a couple of the particular medication groups that we use, um, the anti-inflammatory drugs and the opioids. Uh, there are two slides that I have here on um, the anti-inflammatories. And this first one is uh, uh, many of you will know, and perhaps most of you will know by now, but I'm, I'm just going to refresh memories here that um, really the anti-inflammatories work on cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. Cyclooxygenase 1, or COX-1, is a normal constituent. It's a good thing. We need it. It protects our gastric mucosa. Um, uh, we need it for platelet aggregation and for good renal function. COX-2 actually is an inducible form of the enzyme, so it's not necessarily active. But in the presence of inflammation or trauma uh, uh, or fever, it can be um, uh, induced to be active and gives, give rise to, to pain and fever. So what you really want is a medication that works on this 
but that preserves this function here. So um, the COX-2 um, uh, medications, uh, we have actually, uh, we do actually have some available. Some have received a bad press because of their uh, effect in elderly people, predominantly in heart failure. But this is um, a graph that really divides the um, anti-inflammatories into the COX-1 uh, or the non specific uh, COX inhibitors, so the ones that you might feel would have more side effects, and then the ones that are perhaps relatively safer. And you can see here there's Ketorolac. Um, it has probably the highest side effect profile. The reason it uh, has most utility is for its intravenous use. It's not because it's more effective. It's because you have more options for route of administration. We also use naproxen and ibuprofen, and they're a little better than the Ketorolac in, in terms of side effect. And many of you will know that Ketorolac we tend to use, or Toradol, for um, uh, a limit of 48 hours. Up on the left-hand side here, we have drugs that are all under, they all have to be prescribed, and some of them are expensive. But the ones that we have available are Diclofenac, which has been used in Europe for years, Celecoxib or Celebrex, which is available, and Meloxicam. Celecoxib and Meloxicam are rather expensive. But I think over time, we should be really thinking about uh, switching uh, to the more COX-2 um, uh, inhibitors rather than the non selective anti-inflammatories. So just turning to opioids next. Opioids for pain relief are not known to cause addiction. I'd like to just take a moment to distinguish the notion of addiction from um, a physical dependence. If any of us take opioids for a protracted period of time, we will develop um, uh, a physical dependence on opioids. And if you stop them abruptly, you will get a withdrawal effect. So we mitigate that by coming down off the drug slowly. And that is a strategy that works well. So addiction, by contrast, is drug-seeking behavior for a high. We're not talking about a drug for, um, for, for, for uh, using it for pain control. So in people in whom you're using opioids for pain control, uh, you're at very low risk of addiction, extremely low risk of addiction. Now turning attention to codeine. Codeine works because it's metabolized in the liver to morphine. It turns as uh, genetics involved in this metabolic pathway such that some people lack this pathway of conversion of codeine to morphine, and in these people, codeine would not provide analgesia. There's also ultra-metabolizers uh, ultra, uh, of codeine, and it's possibly rare, more rare, uh, but maybe more dangerous. And there was a very sad case reported in the New England Journal by um, Giddy Corin uh, last year on a baby who was being breastfed by a mother who was receiving codeine for pain control after a cesarean section. And um, the baby was getting a bit sleepy. And in response to that, um, there was encouragement for breastfeeding and so on, thinking that, oh, maybe the baby isn't getting enough nutrition and so on. Um, but the baby was uh, under notes to people getting more and more morphine and died of a respiratory arrest. So that is a pretty uh, devastatingly sad thing to have happened. So for both of these reasons, uh, we now are really trying to transition away from codeine in our hospital. Briefly, uh, but uh, one word about that is that I worry about just suddenly stopping codeine um, prescribing cold turkey in the sense that I think you run the risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, by which I mean if you take codeine away and there are some people who are comfortable with it but not comfortable with morphine, do you then run the risk that nothing will be prescribed? All right, a quick word about Demerol, or uh, more properly known as Meperidine. The Institute for Safe Medical Practice in Canada discourages its use. It has an active metabolite, which is neurotoxic. We virtually stopped using it in our hospital, and I hope that that's the same uh, across Canada. And remember, most people who drink alcohol do not become alcoholics. And likewise, most people exposed to opioids do not become drug abusers. I certainly like my glass of wine in the evening. 
All right. Here are the commonly prescribed analgesics that we use at SickKids. You can see that uh, codeine is lacking from this list. We recommend acetaminophen, ibuprofen because it's over the counter. Um, I think we may move away from that in the fullness of time. Ketorolac really when the oral route isn't available uh, and uh, morphine um, as you get up to moderate and severe pain. And I haven't mentioned the other opioids, but we tend to also use hydromorphone, um, uh, fentanyl, oxycodone uh, commonly in this hospital. I don't have the equivalents here. They're available on tables uh, widely, but we do use them to, uh, in, because different people seem to tolerate different opioids uh, uh, preferentially. So um, I think perhaps we might drop this poll, Doug, in the interest of time. So can we move on to the next slide? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, really this was to get at people who, no, you know what, I am going to get you to do it because I'm interested in the answer. So could you could you do that poll after all? Sure, yeah, the, uh, the poll question is, do you use topical anesthetic for routine blood work or IV insertion? And this is a yes or no question. Uh, so we'll give everyone a few seconds to uh, put in an answer. It's almost 50-50. 54% said yes, they do, and 46% said no, they don't. All right. Thank you, Doug. So um, I, I'm pleased that 50% are using topicals routinely, um, and uh, I think that probably represents reasonable practice. We would like to see it in our organization at 100%. Uh, and just uh, very quickly, in the interest of time, uh, a couple of comments about procedural pain management. Um, and that is in our hospital, we do recommend topical analgesia for all skin breaking procedures. Uh, we recommend the use of a comfort plan, which is a little bit like a recipe card that the kids can carry around with them uh, for repeat attenders so that they can describe the things that work well for them when they have procedures done. So, yes, I like topical. No, I don't like someone to tell me when the needle is coming. Yes, I do like to be distracted and so on and so forth. And we also use comfort kits here, which are big Tupperware containers, which contain age-appropriate distractions such as bubbles and books and squeeze toys, uh, which um, uh, we have evaluated to a certain extent, and these are found to be quite helpful. Uh, sucrose is something that we're increasingly using in the neonatal population. I'm not going to go, uh, and infants up to 18 months, I'm not going to this in detail. I'm going to tantalize you and get you to register for the next uh, webinar series for more detail on this. Uh, in infants, these are the sorts of things that we're recommending for use in our own neonatal intensive care unit. And again, there will be much more on this in the next webinar series. One slide on physical pain management strategies. Do not underestimate the use of heat uh, for relaxing muscles, for ice um, to uh, uh, manage uh, inflammation, the use of positioning and massage, and referral to physical therapies to assess and provide programs to reverse deconditioning processes that occur in the presence of chronic and ongoing pain. We know that regular exercise uh, helps improve sleep, mood, self-esteem, and uh, energy love levels, and we also know that it reduces pain scores. And psychological pain management strategies, the purpose of which is to modify the overall pain experience to maximize adaptive behavior. The strategies we use are education, explanation to reduce anxiety, distractions such as music, use of iPods, videos and reading, relaxation, and when these things aren't adequate, to refer as indicated to the specialist groups that you see listed there. And this is how we tie this in together in our own organization uh, with an algorithm that uh, has the when to assess pain, the how to assess pain, and if pain is present, the pharmacological, physical, and psychological strategies that we recommend. And this is available on our policies and procedures uh, database for people to draw upon at any time. So thank you for your attention, and I will now turn over to the final session by Dr. Stevens, and um, thank you very much. Thanks, Fiona. 
So we're just going to end uh, today's session by really trying to fit everything we've talked about pain within the context of the child, the individual, and how we best assess and manage that into the context of the organization. So I'd like to start out by uh, having Doug ask you the poll question about whether you feel supported by your organization, organization in carrying out pain initiatives. So <clears throat> the question should be up and uh, people are responding. So it's, do you feel supported by your organization in supporting pain initiatives? And it's a yes or no uh, question. So we'll give everyone a few, some, few more seconds to put in an answer. And I think we have just about everybody. Close that one. And yes, 83% do feel they are supported by their organization in supporting pain initiatives. In wow. <laughs> that, that is great to hear because we know that organizational support is essential because often what we hear is the negative uh, side of things from individuals and families. Uh, we hear patient complaints. And when we do audits, as Fiona uh, mentioned to you and showed you early, earlier, often there's poor audit results. So when this is the case, you really have to have your organization's support. In terms of uh, clinical practice, the organization support is helpful when you're developing policies and practice guidelines, when we're trying to uh, develop and implement educational interventions or initiatives, and the same with research initiatives. When we think about what some examples of organizational strategies might be, they're basically directed at either the health professionals or the children and families. So in our own institution, we link with the Learning Institute for the core child health curriculum on pain. So we're really trying to implement this for all health professionals. We also link with the RNAO best practice guidelines, which I'm sure many of you have in your institution. And we also try and engage in community outreach where we have an interprofessional uh, annual or biannual pain conference and also interactive video and documentary. For children and families, we have a website, the About Kids Health website, and we find that it's not just children and families that are using this, but a lot of health professionals. And if you haven't been onto it, I would greatly encourage you uh, to take a look and see what you think. We did a major update on it this year, and it's currently being translated into French and Chinese, so it will be available in uh, three languages. When we also think about uh, research initiatives within the organization, we think about two different things. Uh, one is that we want to uh, generate new knowledge, and we do this through exploring the pain mechanisms and the basic science research, as well as clinical research, where we're looking most often at the best ways to assess and the most effective interventions. But we've known over time that having good uh, evidence or great evidence for that matter does not necessarily change practice. And therefore, we've recently launched on a focus to look at the best strategies to translate research evidence into practice. And we have a, a team grant, the CIHR team grant, where we have 27 investigators, eight pediatric hospital sites, many of you who I'm sure are on the line today, and they stretch from uh, Nova Scotia through to Vancouver. And also within this uh, team grant, we have three projects. And I'll just talk to you about Project 3. Project 1 is really looking at the baseline in terms of pain practices and developing a large uh, research database. Project 2 is looking at context. But Project 3 is looking at an intervention, which we call the tropic intervention for translating research on pain in children into practice. At each of our eight sites, we have four units who are participating. Two units are allocated to the intervention and two to the standard care, so that's 16 in each arm of this study. 
And the intervention really involves establishing and training a small group of committed individuals called the Research Practice Council, reviewing the unit's baseline practices and identifying areas for imp improvement, reviewing the related research ev evidence and sharing that with the group so they can decide on a practice change, and then selecting tailored knowledge translation strategies to target the chosen practice change. And we go through four three-month rapid cycles, followed each one followed by a one-month audit and feedback. And the type of KT strategies that we use are reminders. So these are things like posters, stickers, buttons, stamps, lanyards, pens. The list really goes on and on. And our units have been extremely creative in uh, coming up with reminders, both paper reminders, electronic reminders, verbal reminders. The second big category are educational materials, and these are pamphlets, posters, bulletin board displays, laminated pain tools, online teaching modules. So all of these education materials are examples of KT strategies. Uh, taking that one step further and really focusing on educational outreach, and this is where the strategies get more interactive. So we see bedside teaching on a one-to-one -one basis, in-service, educational days, uh, staff meetings, rounds, all of those kinds of things which are interactive and educational. And finally, audit and feedback. And this is where charts are reviewed or there's some sort of audit. And then the results of these are communicated back to the units through presentations, emails, newsletters, uh, drafts, uh, draws or raffles, or thermometer uh, posters which show the before and after. So I'm just going to show you a few examples. So this is, um, uh, all, these are all from the CIHR team in children's pain. So this could either be a button or a poster or a sticker um, asking if your patient is in pain and reminding to assess and document. Uh, this is an educational poster which is really focusing on that, yes, pokes do hurt, and we need to remember to use analgesia before the pokes, and then there's some recommendations there. So this is really a combination of reminding plus teaching uh, people what they can do. Uh, the audit and feedback, this gives you an idea how we've looked at um, the ordering of sucrose for infants undergoing painful procedures. And the unit had really set a goal for themselves to uh, target 60% uh, of kids successfully uh, having sucrose ordered for painful procedures. And you can see at baseline, they were only at 25%. And by the end of the second audit and feedback, they'd gone up to 45%. So they were still uh, all Altering their strategies to get to their goal. So this is again what audit and feedback could do. So I would just like to summarize by uh, coming up with a few uh, take-home messages. So I think we've learned that pain has consequences, both immediate consequences and long-term far-reaching consequences. We hear stories all the time about how children, especially those with chronic illnesses, have untreated pain uh, early on and then go on to have a lot of anxiety and fear and reluctance uh, for future uh, painful uh, events. So we know that it's really worth it to invest time in the beginning. Uh, validated pain assessment tools have been developed. There's lots of them for all ages, and I see there's a few questions about these which I'll answer in just a minute, but generally they're underutilized in practice. So I think it really behooves us to select a few for our institution for each age group and to really make sure people know about these and teach people how to use them. Another take-home message is that evidence-based pain management strategies exist, but management remains suboptimal. So every time we do an audit, we know that even though we have all of these things and we think that we're implementing, uh, more often than not, uh, we aren't using them as often as we, as we should or we would like to. 
We know that organizational and unit-based support are essential to change pain practices. We've talked a little bit about context and the unit culture, and that is coming up in a future uh, webinar as well, where we're really going to tease apart what is it in the culture that supports pain practice changes. And finally, we've talked a little bit about knowledge translation strategies, the reminders, the education, the educational output, and the audit, audit and feedback. And we know that all of these have varying degrees of success in changing uh, pain practice. So I would just like to end by saying that uh, we've talked quite a bit about our own institution today, and we're very cognizant that variations exist between institutions in the use of pain management strategies, and there certainly could be different policies and procedures uh, that you will need to follow at your institution. But I think you really need to uh, find out more about what is in uh, place at your institution uh, so that you can provide the best pain assessment and management possible. And I would just like to acknowledge our many partners, uh, especially uh, CAFC and CIHR, uh, which have provided funding and expertise and know-how so that we could actually have this webinar with you today. We are running short in time. But uh, throughout the webinar this afternoon, people have been sending us some questions. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer the first two or three questions, and then I'm going to turn this over to Fiona, who will answer the last couple. So I'm actually hopefully not going to disconnect us here. I'm going to uh, put Fiona on speaker, actually. So uh, we both might be able to add a little bit in here. OK. Um, we're going to go ahead. The first question is really about um, what tool was used for normal newborns? Uh, and the examples were around things like a baby that might have a hematoma or bruising. And I guess it's important here to make sure you know that the PIP, which is the validated measure we talked about, is not just for preterm infants and it's not just for hospitalized infants. So you can certainly use it for normal uh, newborns and babies that are even beyond the newborn period. But there are many uh, validated tools to assess pain in infants. Uh, other tools are the NIPS. Uh, there's another one called the BIP. Uh, there is another one called the NPASS. So there are several uh, well-validated measures that can be used with both uh, preterm and hospitalized uh, babies. Uh, the second question was, were there any tools to tease out sedation versus analgesia? So, for example, in an intubated patient, and how do you balance the two? This is really an excellent, an excellent question because often uh, we do find ba uh, babies or children are on a combination of both analgesia and sedatives. So there are tools that have taken this into consideration. Uh, for infants, there's a tool called the NPASS, and the NPASS actually looks at both sedation and agitation. That's a tool by Hamel and uh, Pol Polchowski. And for older children, uh, uh, the comfort scale is a tool that was developed by Ambuel and then revised by um, Monique Van Dyke. And this is a tool that's often used for children in the intensive care unit. And again, this is where um, sedation is taken into consideration along with um, analgesic and uh, comfort. So these are broader tools. They're not pain uh, specific uh, per se, but they certainly um, get at pain. Another um, question that came up was around um, sucrose. And uh, th this is a common question that we get asked. Most of what you see published and most of the reviews that are done uh, are around the use of sucrose in ne neonates uh, or, or infants under three months of age. So 
So the question is, can sucrose be used in infants over three months? Now, we've just finished a review, a Cochrane review, that looks at neonates, which really has strengthened um, our confidence in the efficacy of sucrose in the newborns. Uh, in the babies older than three months, there is sufficient evidence of sucrose analgesia up to 12 months of age. And in this age group, there's been about 17 trials, uh, and 14 out of the 17 are during immunization. However, there's very little evidence of analgesia beyond 12 months of age with sucrose. There's two studies including infants aged 18 months of age, and they show conflicting results. So one says it works and one says it doesn't. So this is an area where we certainly need more research in the older infant or the toddler uh, population. And again, this is a topic that will be covered um, more by Denise Harrison and Margot Latimer in the next uh, seminar. And I think the final question um, that I will look at is um, someone has asked the question that um, they've read that topical anesthetic, in particularly EMLA, is ineffective uh, for heel pokes, and also that it's not recommended for PREMS. Well, you are right. We've, um, there's been studies that we've done and studies that other people have done that have looked at the efficacy of EMLA, which is very effective for um, immunizations, IV starts, but not particularly effective for, uh, for heel lances. And un this is unfortunate because in this age group, uh, heel lances are about 50 to 70 percent of the, of the painful procedures that we do. And there's several hypotheses around this. Uh, and uh, some of these are that the perfusion isn't as good in the heel as it is in other areas of the, of the body, that the heel has multiple injuries to it already from repeated heel lances, that the skin thickness is different there, and the uh, topical analgesia, anesthesia is not penetrating as well. So there are many uh, hypotheses, but we do know that it's not effective, and this is why uh, interventions such as sucrose, uh, bundling, um, positioning of the baby, using non-nutritive sucking distraction, why these are also important to use in these very common uh, types of painful procedures. So I don't know whether Fiona wants to add to that, but she certainly has a few more um, questions um, to, to address. Just while she's taking her place, I see one more quick question has come up, and that's whether or not we advocate sucrose for eye examinations for retinopathy of prematurity. And yes, there are uh, a few studies that have looked at this where small volumes, uh, just a drop or two throughout the procedure in conjunction with a pacifier uh, or non-nutritive sucking has been found to be effective. So this is another instance where you could use uh, sucrose. So I'll turn over to Fiona, and I'll just be signing off myself now, and again, thanking you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I am mindful that we've gone beyond 3.30. Uh, there are a few questions. If it's all right by the organizers, uh, Doug at CAFC, then I will just take five minutes to address a few of these. Absolutely. We, uh, we still have about 95 lines still hanging in, so I think people are interested in hearing these answers. Okay, great. Well, um, the first question that I wanted to address was I wanted to come back to the question that I mentioned during the presentation uh, regarding whether there are standardized approaches to managing pain for particular uh, surgeries, both uh, intra- and postoperatively. And actually what I would like to say is that my response to this question is actually very similar to how I manage uh, nearly all pain in the sort of anesthesia uh, domain, which is this, that I would always use a topical anesthetic for IV starts. I would always be uh, considering using acetaminophen, an anti-inflammatory, and an opioid, unless there's some sort of contraindication for any of these. 
And I would also add in some sort of regional or local anesthetic technique to complement. But you would throw some of these things or exclude some of these things uh, if they weren't appropriate. So for the tonsillectomy, you might not use the anti-inflammatories because there's some studies that show that there's increased bleeding afterwards. Um, and uh, likewise, for the, for the hernia, you uh, would encourage the use of a regional technique because we know that those are effective. Just coming on to the question of managing pain in sickle cell patients, the dosing requirements for a 12-month-old, um, again, I would use the same approach. I would use a, a topical anesthetic to get an IV in if it was required. I would use an oral route for medication, uh, and I would use a dose escalation guidelines for an opioid-naive patient and either do that orally or intravenously depending on how distressed the child was. There was a question also on the relative merits of infusions versus um, boluses in sickle cell disease and there's no strong evidence to suggest that one over the other is better but we do find that sleep is improved if you have a background infusion. We do tend to avoid a background infusion, however, in the very young children. There have been several questions on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, the first was whether we recommend alternating acetaminophen and ibuprofen or giving them together. So the first point is this, that they're a safe combination and a very good combination uh, for um, pain control for nearly uh, well, for majority of uh, typical aches and pains and sprains, and we use this combination very widely in the hospital. You can use, the answer to the question is, you can use full doses of both regularly. So for convenience, I would, would recommend prescribing them together at their sort of four to six hour window in the total dose required, not halved because you're using two different drugs. That will really um, uh, uh, help smooth out analgesia and uh, in many occasions uh, get rid of the requirement for opioids as well. There's a question about why I suggest switching to COX-2 inhibitors. And I perhaps should clarify this. I think in the acute uh, arena, uh, it is fine to use the relatively cheap over-the-counter non-steroidals such as ibuprofen. But for those taking long-term anti-inflammatories, um, because of the risks of side effects, in particular um, uh, gastric uh, and duodenal uh, ulcers, uh, I would recommend using a COX-2 inhibitor or at least some sort of gastric protection like a proton pump inhibitor uh, to protect the gastric mucosa. There was a question on where the, uh, whether, um, given that ibuprofen is contraindicated for neonates, why is it used for the treatment of PDA? And the answer is this. It's contraindicated in neonates because in most neonates, we want the PDA to close. So um, uh, there's no real medical contraindication to the drug itself except for the effect on the PDA. So in neonates in whom you want the PDAs to remain open, I suppose that ibuprofen would not be contraindicated. That's a very specific question, but I hope it answers uh, that. There's a question on contraindications to the use of heat for pain management. Could, could I refer to any? And I really can't think of any medical contraindications to uh, using heat, except for to say that it must always be used safely. I can, however, um, think of a contraindication for using ice and cooling strategies, and that is for the pain associated with vaso-occlusive crisis in sickle cell disease because it leads to further vasoconstriction and worsen sickling. And the final question is on um, uh, whether I would advise that adolescents suffering 
advanced muscular dystrophy pain, whether they be referred to a chronic pain team. And I would say without hesitation that that is entirely appropriate, but that does not uh, get rid of the shared responsibility for all health professionals to be assessing and managing pain for all children, neonates, children, and adolescents. So all health professionals can help in some way with regards to assessing pain uh, and um, uh, putting in place uh, pain interventions. Um, so yes, referral to the chronic pain team would be appropriate, um, but there are other things that other people can do. So those are the final we just have two uh, last questions. I don't want people to feel like we haven't answered your question. And if you have other questions, you by all means can email either uh, Fiona or I at SickKids, and we will definitely answer your questions. But just to finish up, someone asked the question about, um, it was in relation to uh, skin breaking procedures, routine things like blood work, where often um, there is this feeling that topical analgesics cause doing such procedures to be more difficult, for example, causing vasoconstriction. And that's particularly true with uh, EMLA cream, where you see that. And you might want to consider either an alternative, faster-acting um, topical anesthetic, such as a methacaine, or you might want to uh, try uh, other non-pharmacologic uh, interventions there. I'd just like to add to that. In our hospital now, we tend to use Maxiline, which is a topical preparation of 4% lidocaine, which is a little faster than EMLA. It's well tolerated. <laughs> does not actually require a um, tagadam, um, an occlusive dressing on it. And so uh, Maxiline is what we tend to recommend in this hospital. Okay, and lastly, um, there's this other situation where infants who've been on analgesia for quite some time, um, the practice is to try and wean them rapidly so that they can be extubated. And then the situation arrives where they suffer through withdrawal because they don't get further analgesia um, due to possible respiratory, respiratory depression. So this is, uh, I hope, not too common a practice, but it's certainly one that we've heard before. And again, this is a judgment call where you'd really have to have uh, the specifics of the case, but usually I guess what we would suggest here is to make sure that you try to follow some weaning guidelines. And withdrawal is uncommon um, if the baby's been on uh, opioids for less than three days. And those that have been on for longer periods of time, this is where uh, weaning slowly really uh, helps the situation. And those go along with assessing pain and using opioid weaning and doing withdrawal uh, scores. There's one that was developed way back in the 70s uh, called the Finnegan score, and this is in newborns. But there's a brand new one that's just come out, which is called the Watt 1 score, um, and it was published by Linda Frank in 2008 or 2009, 2008. So I think that we um, have answered as many questions as we can uh, in the short time uh, frame. It feels like this hour and a half has really flown by quickly. We've really enjoyed having the opportunity to speak with you today. And this is meant to be an overview on pain in children, and we will be uh, scheduling much more uh, specific kinds of topics, uh, two more in 2010, and we hope uh, for even more in the future. So I would like to say thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure uh, Fiona joins me in that, and we'll turn it back to Doug. Well, can I just add in one thing? I certainly do uh, appreciate your attention, and the one final thing I want to mention is that the only way we can get better is if you complete evaluation. So we would be very pleased uh, if you could um, uh, attend to that. And uh, thank you very much, and have a good afternoon, and well done, Canada, in the Olympics. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Stevens and Dr. Campbell. That was a great presentation. We got a lot of questions. This has definitely generated a lot of interest and touched the core with so many within our child and youth health community. Uh, in addition to the speakers who have done such a great job, I would also like to thank the Canadian Institute for Health Research for providing funding to the team in children's pain, as well as for this podcast series.